Napoleon's Brothers and Sisters, Part 1, Older and Wiser. Napoleon Bonaparte is one of the most famous people in history. He was born into an impoverished minor noble family on the island of Corsica. But his remarkable skills on the battlefield and in politics saw him rise to emperor of France and conqueror of much of Europe. But he was not the only Bonaparte making waves in the 19th century. His brother's prominent positions in the revolutionary government opened the door for him to seize power in the first place. And once he had it, he set his seven surviving siblings up with thrones of their own and political marriages that gave him an advantage. Napoleon was a domineering head of the family. He demanded that his brothers and sisters submit to his will and often clashed with them about how to run their own kingdoms and families, even pushing one of his brothers to defect to his greatest enemy, the British all in the name of establishing a new Bonaparte dynasty to rule over Europe. Let's take a look at the emperor's childhood and meet his oldest brothers and sister. Carlo Bonaparte was the third son of a noble family from Tuscany who were living on the Genoese-controlled island of Corsica. At 18, he married 14-year-old Maria Letizia Romolino, the daughter of an old noble Corsican family. Letizia was an outspoken firebrand. Her most famous son inherited her personality. Carlo received a large inheritance from his father, and Letizia's dowry provided the family with 31 acres, including a mill and a bakery, which provided for them comfortably. Within months of their wedding, Letizia gave birth to their first child, Napoleon. He was born and died on August 17, 1765. His grieving parents baptized him Napoleon, which was a popular Italian name of the time. Had he lived, his younger brother and future conqueror of Europe would have had a different name. In this age of high childhood mortality, it was common practice to name younger siblings in honor of their deceased older siblings. The couple's second child, Maria Anna, died of an unknown illness two days before her first birthday. In 1768, Genoa gave Corsica to King Louis XV of France in payment for a debt. The Corsicans, who were already pushing for independence, were outraged by the French takeover. Those who spoke out against the new regime were forced to flee the city of Ayacho for the mountains. Carlo, Letizia, and their newborn son, Joseph, were among the refugees. From there, they launched a guerrilla campaign against the French. Letizia, pregnant, fought by her husband's side. But the revolt failed. The family returned to town and accepted their new French overlords, just in time for Letizia to give birth to her fourth child, Napoleon. Letizia struggled to breastfeed and hired a wet nurse and servant who raised the children while she saw to the household duties. When the children were about eight or nine years old, they were each sent to France to be educated at boarding schools, as was common practice among the upper class at the time. Carlo, who had trained as a lawyer, was soon ensconced in the new French-run government of Corsica. He was honored with a number of titles and positions, but was always hungry for more. He embarked on a number of risky business ventures, sued multiple people in frivolous lawsuits, and gambled away the family's money. He wrote of a visit to the court at Versailles, I received 4,000 francs from the king and 1,000 crowns from the government, but I came back without a penny. At 35, Carlo began to grow weak and suffered constant pain. He traveled to southern France for treatment, but died in 1785, age 38, of stomach cancer. He left Letizia and their eight surviving children penniless. Upper-class women of the time had few opportunities to earn a living without a man, and Letizia still had young children to care for. She resorted to taking in laundry and relied on the salaries of her two eldest sons. Joseph was the oldest of the Bonaparte children to survive infancy. 
At 18, after finishing his education as a lawyer, he returned to Corsica to help his mother. There he became involved in politics. His younger brother, Napoleon, joined him. They disagreed with the leading politician, Pasquale Paoli, who was a royalist while the Bonapartes supported the French Revolution. They decried Paoli as a traitor and his supporters chased the family out of Corsica, pillaging their home and burning it down. The Bonapartes resettled in France just as the reign of terror was getting underway. In order to avoid being identified and persecuted as aristocrats, Letizia and her daughters claimed to be dressmakers on their passports, which were forged by Napoleon. But as they were still destitute and had to queue for food at the local soup kitchen, their disguise was effective. The only money coming in was from Napoleon's salary as a soldier in the French army. But fortunately, the little corporal showed great promise. After winning his first major battle, he was promoted to general. He was then able to move his mother and siblings into a modest chateau. Meanwhile, Joseph embarked upon a career in politics in Paris. He won a seat in the Council of 500, the lower house of the revolutionary legislature. He married Julie Clary, the daughter of a wealthy silk merchant. The couple had a happy union and two daughters. Joseph was named French ambassador to Rome and he signed a treaty of friendship between France and the United States. Next, he won a seat in the Council of Ancients, the legislature's upper house, and from this position in 1799, he aided his younger brother, Napoleon, to overthrow the Directory and become the first consul and effective ruler of France. To thank him, Napoleon gave Joseph the former royal villa Chateau du Villandry. For his mother, Napoleon rebuilt Casa Bonaparte in Corsica. He instructed his newly appointed puppet ruler there that he could not make any appointments without seeking Letizia's approval. In 1804, Napoleon had himself declared Emperor of France. He then went to war with Austria to continue expanding his empire. King Ferdinand IV of Naples agreed to stay out of the conflict, but eventually he sided with Austria. When Napoleon won the war, he turned his wrath on Ferdinand and kicked him off his throne. Being of Italian origin himself, he was all too happy to take the peninsula under his control. He sent his big brother Joseph to nominally oversee the invasion force and then named him King of Naples and Sicily. Joseph was greeted warmly by the Neapolitans who hadn't been crazy about Ferdinand. Joseph kept existing officials in their positions and didn't want to be seen as a foreign invader. He reformed the nation to bring Naples the benefits of the French Revolution without its excesses. He abolished the feudal system, nationalized church land, gave former monks jobs as teachers, and promoted education, including for girls. He launched a public works program which built highways and installed streetlights. His many changes doubled the national revenue. Though there was no constitution in place and Joseph was an enlightened despot, he did not abuse his power and was well liked. After two years on the throne, Napoleon called on Joseph to leave Naples and take the throne of his newest conquest, Spain. Joseph was very reluctant, but he couldn't say no to Napoleon. In Spain, French rule and thus King Joseph were incredibly unpopular. The Spanish wanted the Bourbon King Ferdinand VII back on the throne, and the Catholic nation resented the Bonaparte's secularism. Pamphlets nicknamed Joseph Joe Bottle and painted him as an indolent alcoholic, when in fact he rarely drank. The Peninsula War broke out and the royals were forced to flee Madrid. Joseph, not much of a military man, asked Napoleon to allow him to abdicate and send someone else. But the emperor refused and ordered Joseph to take back the nation. While he did retake the capital, Joseph's control over Spain was always shaky. After five years on the throne, his army was defeated by the British-led coalition, and he abdicated and returned to Paris. 
Napoleon named Joseph lieutenant general of the empire and left him in control of Paris while he went off to lose to the coalition army. Napoleon was exiled to the island of Elba, but within months he escaped and retook France for 100 days. He was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 and was exiled to the more remote island of St. Helena. He died there six years later, probably of stomach cancer, just like his father. Out of power, Joseph moved to the United States. He sold jewels he had stolen from the Spanish monarchy to set himself up in style on an estate called Point Breeze in Bordentown, New Jersey. It was described as the second finest house in America after the White House. In 1820, Mexican revolutionaries offered to crown Joseph Emperor of Mexico, but he declined. In 1832, Napoleon's only son, Napoleon II, died. Thus, Joseph became the rightful emperor of France in the eyes of Bonapartists. Joseph spent his final years in Rome, sharing a home, Palazzo Bonaparte, with his mother, Letizia, who lived comfortably on her many shrewd investments and reached the age of 85. Joseph died in 1844, age 76. His wife Julia's sister Desiree was married to one of Napoleon's top generals, a man named Jean Bernadotte. In 1810, while Napoleon was at the height of his power, and most of Europe was keen to get on his good side, Jean was unexpectedly elected heir to the childless King Charles XIII of Sweden. In 1818, he became King Charles XIV John of Sweden and Norway, establishing the Bernadotte dynasty, which still rules Sweden to this day. Napoleon was born in 1769, 20 months after his brother Joseph. After them, the Bonapartes suffered another string of tragedies. Maria Anna was born and died on the same day in 1770. She was named for her deceased older sister. A third, Maria Anna, was born in 1771, but only lived for four months. Yet another stillborn son was born, but not named. By this time, Letizia had carried and given birth to seven children, but only had two living sons, Joseph and Napoleon. She went on to have six more children, and thankfully, they all survived. Lucien, the third surviving son, was born in 1775. He showed intellect and an interest in history from a young age. He followed his older brothers to military school in France and was also educated at a seminary, though he never became a priest. He was 14 when the revolution broke out. He became a popular political public speaker in Corsica, nicknaming himself Brutus. He was a supporter of Robespierre, which landed him in prison during the Reign of Terror. He got out of that and married Christine Boyer, the illiterate daughter of an innkeeper. His ambitious mother and older brother disapproved of the match, but Lucien didn't need his big brother's approval. He was popular on his own terms and was elected president of the Council of 500. He was the only Bonaparte sibling who didn't owe his position in some part to Napoleon, and this was a great source of tension between the brothers. In fact, Lucien was a crucial part of Napoleon's coup de tete of the French government in 1799. Lucien galvanized the legislature behind his brother by mounting a horse, pointing a sword at Napoleon's chest, and swearing to run him through if he ever betrayed the principles of liberté, égalité, and fraternité. The following day, Lucien arranged for Napoleon's formal election as first consul. In thanks, Napoleon made Lucien Minister of the Interior, from which position he announced that the French people had voted 99.9% .9 in favor of Napoleon's new constitution, results which he almost certainly falsified. Next, Napoleon made Lucien ambassador to Spain. 
There he convinced King Ferdinand VII to sign over the Louisiana Territory in North America to the French. Napoleon planned to use the vast land to set up a French colonial empire, but the area proved too difficult to control from afar. Two years later, Napoleon sold it to U.S. President Thomas Jefferson and used the money to fund his conquests closer to home. Both Lucien and Joseph opposed Napoleon naming himself emperor because it flew in the face of the ideals of the revolution. The brothers argued, and neither Joseph nor Lucien were invited to Napoleon's grand coronation. In protest over the spat, Leticia also refused to attend. But Napoleon requested that Jacques-Louis David paint the fiction of his happy family into his epic painting, The Coronation of Napoleon. In it, his absent mother and brother Joseph beam at him during his greatest moment of triumph, though Lucien was still left conspicuously out of the painting. When his first wife, Christine, died, Napoleon ordered him to marry Princess Maria Luisa of Spain, but he refused, instead eloping with Alexandrine de Blichon and fleeing to Rome with her. They had nine children. Napoleon put pressure on Lucien to divorce his wife and return to France, but he refused. The emperor conquered the papal state, imprisoned Pope Pius VII, and held Lucien under house arrest. He and his family managed to escape and set sail for the United States, but their ship was captured by Napoleon's greatest enemies, the British. When the family was brought back to England, crowds cheered them. They loved Lucien as he stood up to his brother. He was provided an estate and a comfortable living in Worcestershire, where he occupied himself with writing a heroic poem about Charlemagne. Napoleon meanwhile considered his brother a traitor and struck his name from the Bonaparte family almanac. But during the 100 days when Napoleon retook France, Lucien returned to the continent to support his brother. Napoleon named Lucien a French prince and added his 14 children back into the imperial family. After Waterloo and his brother's final fall, Lucien retired to Italy along with his mother and many of his siblings. He died there in 1840, age 65, also of stomach cancer. Maria Anna was born in 1777. She was the first daughter to survive infancy and was named in honor of her three deceased older sisters. Perhaps to avoid painful memories, she was nicknamed Elisa. At seven, she was sent to an elite girls' boarding school in Paris. She visited her older brother Napoleon who was attending military academy nearby. The French Revolution broke out when Elisa was 15 and she and Napoleon fled the country and headed home. At 20, she married fellow Corsican nobleman Felice Bocciocchi, though Napoleon had reservations about the marriage as Felice was a poor soldier. After the family moved to France and while her brothers rose in political and martial power, Elisa and Lucien held an artistic and literary salon in Paris. When Lucien's first wife died, Elisa cared for their two daughters. She had given birth to four children, but only one daughter survived childhood. When Napoleon became emperor, Elisa and her sisters persuaded him to create them imperial princesses, and they adopted the style Imperial Highness. In Jacques-Louis David's painting, all three Bonaparte sisters, Elisa, Pauline, and Caroline, can be seen standing behind Josephine as Napoleon prepares to crown her. The three sisters did indeed attend, but in reality, they and their mother were all intensely jealous of Josephine and resented the honors Napoleon lavished upon her and her children. The emperor named Elisa and her husband Princess and Prince of Piombino, a small but strategically important Italian state. Once ensconced in their principality, Elisa made all the political decisions, while Felice was satisfied to stick with military matters. She was Napoleon's only sister to hold political power. 
but French occupation was not popular in Piombino, and neither was Elisa. Napoleon added Massa and Carrara to her possessions. Carrara was one of the biggest white marble suppliers in Europe, and Elisa set up a sculpture academy and a bank to promote converting the raw marble to much more valuable works of art, thus importing Carrara marble sculptures all over the world. She bankrolled education for boys and girls, built roads and aqueduct, and turned the capital, Lucca, into a popular spa destination. But she demolished a cathedral to expand her own palace. After nine years in Piombino, Elisa asked Napoleon to put her in charge of the much grander Italian state of Tuscany. He obliged, making her a Grand Duchess. Again, she was coldly received. Her arrival in Florence coincided with a revolt over forced conscription into Napoleon's army, which resulted in the assassination of the mayor. Elisa continued to support the arts and sciences in this historic center for both, but she made herself even more unpopular by closing monasteries and nationalizing church land. When Napoleon took over the Papal State and removed Pope Pius VII, the pontiff sought refuge in Tuscany, but Elisa turned him away. Religious Italians were not impressed. Elisa had a sharp tongue and wasn't afraid to challenge the emperor, leading to frequent conflicts between them. When she traveled to Paris to attend his wedding to Marie Louise of Austria, Napoleon took the opportunity to demand that she repay money he had lent her to build her sculpture academy. She paid up, but when she returned home, she found Napoleon had sent envoys to demand the money again. She refused to pay twice, so Napoleon demanded a conscription of Tuscan men. The new draft destroyed what little support Elisa had built there, and she was forced to leave her Grand Duchy. She went back to Piombino, and despite the animosity of the community, she bought and restored a villa. Her brother's wars in Italy forced her to flee again to Austria, while pregnant. She was there when Napoleon was defeated by the coalition, and she was arrested and held prisoner for five months. Her fifth child, Frederic, was born during this time. Luckily, he survived childhood. Elisa was eventually allowed to return to Italy and be with her family. There she became involved in archaeological digs. She contracted a fatal illness at an excavation site and died at the age of 43, the only adult Bonaparte sibling not to outlive Napoleon. In next week's episode, we'll meet the emperor's four youngest siblings, Louis, who was forced to marry Napoleon's stepdaughter and sent to rule Holland, Pauline, who was sent with her husband to take control of Haiti, Caroline, queen of Naples, and Jerome, who abandoned his pregnant wife on his big brother's orders. Don't want to wait to see the next episode? Patrons get exclusive early access to almost all of my multi-part series on Patreon early. If you would like to become a patron and help me make more fascinating history videos, check out the link in the description. Thank you for watching.